At the end of October 2012, the sailing ship Bounty was scheduled to sail from Connecticut to Florida. However, there was one major obstacle in her way, Superstorm Sandy. The decision to sail was up to the captain. They did not have to sail through the storm. They could have waited. But the captain wanted to test his mettle and decided to risk the ship, his life, and the lives of his crew. The bounty sank 120 miles off the coast of North Carolina. Two people were killed in the incident, including the captain himself. The tall ship Bounty was a replica of an 18th century English cargo ship of the same name. The story of the original HMS Bounty is a tale for another day, but in brief, it was an English cargo ship built in 1784 that was purchased by the British Royal Navy with a particular mission in mind, to sail to Tahiti to pick up breadfruit plants and deliver them to the West Indies where they could be planted to provide food for slaves. However, after the crew had spent some time in Tahiti, they loved it so much that they didn't want to leave. This, combined with the fact that their captain, William Bly, was apparently a real hard ass, led to a mutiny not long after departing Tahiti. The mutineers, led by Fletcher Christian, took control of the bounty and returned to Tahiti. In most modern accounts of the story, the mutineers are portrayed as tragic heroes who rose up against the tyrannical captain, but we will never really know how it all went down. Regardless of the circumstances, the Royal Navy did not like this at all, so Fletcher Christian and the mutineers were forced to flee Tahiti and were chased all around the South Pacific archipelago before settling down in Pitcairn Island. They burned the bounty in what is now known as Bounty Bay to prevent detection by passing Royal Navy ships and remained undiscovered for almost 20 years. The replica bounty that we're focusing on today was commissioned by MGM Studios in 1960 to be featured in the film Mutiny on the Bounty, which is based on the story of the original HMS Bounty. Mr. Christian? You'll not put your foot on me again. The replica bounty was the first large wooden sailing ship built from scratch for a movie, rather than converting an existing vessel. It took over 200 workers eight months to build the ship using traditional manufacturing methods. The ship was built with similar proportions to the original, except the dimensions were scaled up to accommodate film crews and equipment. The original bounty was 90 feet long with an 11 foot draft. The replica bounty was 120 feet long with a 13-foot draft and weighed nearly twice as much as the original. After construction in Nova Scotia, the bounty set off on its maiden voyage in the summer of 1960, bound for Tahiti via the Panama Canal to film Mutiny on the Bounty. You've probably seen the bounty before, because even if you haven't seen Mutiny on the Bounty, the ship was featured in several other movies and television shows afterwards, including the 1983 film Yellowbeard. In all the Spanish main, only one name makes cutthroats <coughs> hoist their sails, hide their loot, <coughs> and hold their noses. <coughs> Yellowbeard. The 1990 film Treasure Island. We sail. sail? We sail tomorrow, boy. <laughs> to the good ship Hispaniola, gentlemen. A sweeter ship you could not imagine. I give you joy of her, sir. <laughs> the 2004 SpongeBob SquarePants movie. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? SpongeBob SquarePants. The 2005 pornographic film Pirates. Well Sinker. Faithful crew of the Sea Stallion, I'm about to lead you on a perilous journey. We're going to hunt down and kill the most notorious and dangerous of all pirates. Captain Victor Stagnetti and his pirate ship, the Devil's Rose. Well said, Captain. And the 2006 film, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. Summon the Kraken! By 2012, the Bounty was owned by the HMS Bounty Organization, whose mission was to teach sailing to adventurous volunteer crew members. 
The organization also provided leadership and team building opportunities to universities and nonprofit organizations. At the time, the Bounty was considered by the U.S. Coast Guard as a moored attraction vessel, which meant that visitors could come aboard while it was berthed, but they could not remain on board while the ship was underway. The HMS Bounty organization sought approval for the Bounty to carry passengers while sailing, but were required to make a few modifications to the vessel before they were allowed. These modifications included sealing open holes in the watertight bulkheads and fitting a flame screen to the fuel tank vent. However, the organization opted not to make these safety modifications, citing financial constraints. On September 17, 2012, the Bounty began a months-long period of maintenance in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. The vast majority of the work was performed by the volunteer Bounty crew and included installing new fuel tanks, repositioning water tanks, installing a new set of stairs from the main deck down to the below deck, constructing new spars for the masts, and repairing the hull which consisted of driving material into the seams between the wooden boards and applying sealant to ensure it is watertight. All of this work was performed under the supervision of Captain Robin Walbridge, who had 17 years of experience aboard the Bounty. While Captain Walbridge was a seasoned sailor and intimately familiar with the Bounty, the same could not be said for the crew. Of the 15 other crew members, 10 had less than six months experience with the vessel, and nine had never worked on any other tall ship either. Only the captain and four crew members had more than two years of experience on such ships. Despite this inexperience, the shipyard workers would later state that the maintenance work done by the crew of the Bounty was adequately performed. However, they were not given the best materials to work with. The sealants that the captain had provided for waterproofing the hull were intended for windows, kitchens, and baths, not water immersion or marine environments. During an inspection of the vessel by shipyard workers, several areas of rotten hull were discovered. Captain Walridge had been aware of some of them, but there were new additional areas that were discovered. Upon learning that the rot in the hull was more widespread than he realized, Captain Walbridge instructed the crew to simply paint over the rotted areas. Repairs would have to wait until next year because of time and financial constraints. The first event for the Bounty after this maintenance period was a meeting with the Navy submarine Mississippi in New London, Connecticut. The Bounty departed Booth Bay Harbor on October 21st. The brief trip was mostly uneventful, but crew members noticed that the electric bilge dewatering system, which consisted of electric pumps to remove water that entered the ship, was not functioning properly. The pumps were taking longer than normal to get primed, and were much slower at removing the water from the compartments than they once were. When Captain Walbridge was made aware of the issue, he managed to fix the pumps, but he did not tell anyone what was wrong or how he had fixed them. The bounty arrived in New London on October 23rd. During the meeting with the USS Mississippi, Navy personnel from the submarine sailed aboard the bounty, and after that, several of the crew members of the bounty toured the Navy submarine. These events occurred without incident, and Navy personnel would later say that the crew of the Bounty seemed well-trained. On the evening of October 25th, the Bounty was due to begin sailing down to St. Petersburg, Florida for another engagement on November 10th. However, there was a storm brewing. Tropical Storm Sandy had reached hurricane strength just the previous day. At the time, Hurricane Sandy had been gaining strength in the Caribbean. Weather forecasts predicted that it would travel north off the east coast of the United States before turning west and making landfall somewhere between the Delmarva Peninsula and New York City. As if that wasn't bad enough, another storm was developing off the east coast. This storm would combine with Hurricane Sandy and increase its intensity. Weather authorities dubbed the combination Superstorm Sandy. In light of the developing news regarding Hurricane Sandy, Captain Walbridge called a crew meeting at 5 p.m. on October 25th, the same evening they were planning on beginning their trip to Florida. He told the crew that he still planned to sail the Bounty to St. Petersburg and they were departing in one hour. His intention was to take the Bounty southeast, far out to sea, and allow the hurricane to pass southwest of them. He stated that during a storm, a ship was safer at sea than in port. He praised the ability of the Bounty to handle rough weather and said that they could even use hurricane winds to their advantage. In the meeting, Captain Walbridge acknowledged that there would be some risks as they were certain to encounter rough water, 
so he told the crew members that they were free to leave and rejoin the vessel later, but they would have to arrange and pay for their own transportation to St. Petersburg. And also, if anyone left, they would be making more work for those that remain because they were already undermanned. The crew respected Captain Walbridge, and they relied on his judgment since they were inexperienced. Camaraderie among the crew was high, and no one wanted to miss out on the adventure or leave their friends further undermanned. As such, no one chose to leave. To be clear, the bounty did not have to sail into the storm. No evidence suggests that Captain Walbridge was under any pressure to arrive in St. Petersburg on the target day, November 10th. Additionally, the bounty could complete the trip to St. Petersburg in just 10 days, so they could have chosen to wait out the hurricane in New London and still arrived on time. Captain Walbridge did not need to sail into the hurricane. He was not pressured to sail into the hurricane. He just wanted to sail into the hurricane. So, to recap the current situation before we get into the journey. The Bounty was a wooden replica of an 18th century ship, and by now it was more than 50 years old itself. The crew was undermanned and inexperienced. There were holes in the watertight bulkheads. The fuel tank had known fire hazards. The ship had just undergone extensive maintenance of critical components by inexperienced workers, including sealing the leaky hull. The hull was sealed using improper materials. The hull had numerous rotted areas that were covered up by paint. The pumps that removed water that leaked into the ship were not working properly, and the captain was the only one who knew how to fix them. With all of this in mind, when Captain Walbridge learned of a hurricane on its way towards them, he could have decided to wait to sail, but he didn't. He decided to convince the crew who respected him and relied on his superior experience to sail into the hurricane. And so, at 6 p.m. on October 25th, the bounty set sail for St. Petersburg, Florida. At the time, Hurricane Sandy was 125 miles east-southeast of Nassau in the Bahamas, but it was making its way north along the Atlantic coast. For that first night and following day, the bounty sailed southeast without issue in good weather. There was no visible sign of the approaching storm. At this time, Captain Walbridge sent an email to the HMS Bounty Organization describing his plan, which was to get as far out to sea southeast as they could to give them room to maneuver according to what the storm did in the following days. He sent another email to his friend, which said, Looks like I might be able to tell you how far one can drift in a hurricane. Sandy looks like a mean one. Right now we are on a converging course. I'm actually headed to the dangerous side of it. At times like this, I like to think about sailors 200 years ago. There are not signs in the sky. Barometer is steady. Winds are light. I always watch when I know there is a storm for the first telltale signs. Right now, there are none. On the evening of the 26th, the bounty received weather forecasts indicating that Hurricane Sandy was heading north, but would likely turn west and make landfall on the New Jersey coastline. This prediction meant that the best course of action for the bounty would be to remain out to sea in the east, because any travel back towards shore would increase the risk that they would encounter the storm. However, Captain Walbridge opted to change course. They began heading southwest. Apparently, Captain Walbridge's plan was to position the ship on the west side of the hurricane because the winds are generally milder on that side. In the northern hemisphere, hurricanes rotate counterclockwise. Since the storm was traveling north, the winds on the right side are moving at the speed they are circling the eye plus the speed the hurricane is traveling. On the left side, the winds are moving at the speed they are circling the eye minus the speed the hurricane is traveling. Relative to the ground, the winds on the right side are moving faster than the winds on the left side. This is why mariners sometimes refer to the right side of the hurricane as the dangerous semicircle and the left side as the navigable semicircle. However, both sides are dangerous and winds are very strong near the eye regardless of which side you are on. By choosing to alter course southwest, the bounty did position itself on the left side of the hurricane, but it also found itself much closer to the eye and would experience significantly stronger winds than if it had stayed course east. On the following day, the 27th, the bounty encountered the hurricane. Strong winds began buffeting the ship, and the sea was getting rough. 
Winds were at 30 plus knots and the sea rolled in swells 15 feet high and conditions were worsening. The crew members were having difficulty walking around on the ship because of the magnitude of the swells and a handful of them became seasick. One of the crewmen fell and broke a bone in his right hand. Even in good weather, water would always gradually leak into the bounty. Remember the state of the hole. But the bilge pumps would be able to pump the water back out at least as fast as it was entering. Now though, in the rough weather within the long reaching arms of the hurricane, water was entering the ship much faster. The ship began taking on water faster than the pumps could remove it. By that evening, the water in the bilge was three feet deep. Captain Walbridge attempted to activate emergency backup pumps to supplement the regular pumps, but only one, a small portable pump, would start. They had not tested these backup pumps to ensure they were working before beginning the journey. The following day, the 28th, the bounty was approximately 200 miles north-northwest of the eye of the hurricane. The crew was barely keeping the vessel steady in the relentless wind and violent seas. By this time, winds exceeded 90 knots and swells were 30 feet high. The crew was exhausted. They were unable to sleep the night before because of the conditions. In addition, the ship had ingested so much water that their beds were wet. Misfortunes were rapidly escalating. Water in the bilge was back to three feet deep, even with the backup pump running in addition to the main pumps. The same crewmate that had previously broken his hand fell again, suffering a gash in his left arm. The sight glass for one of the ship's two propulsion engines somehow broke, allowing all the fuel for that engine to spill into the bilge, mixing with the water. That engine no longer functioned, and the fumes from the fuel made it dangerous to spend too long in the enclosed space. The four-course sail ripped in the unrelenting wind, and Captain Walridge was injured in a fall. The crew could see he was in visible pain. By the evening, the challenge to keep the remaining engine, generators, and pumps running was becoming impossible. At this point, Chief Mate John Svensson suggested to Captain Walbridge that they call the Coast Guard for rescue. Captain Walbridge refused and insisted on carrying on. Within hours, water in the bilge was more than four feet deep. Another crew member fell and suffered broken ribs, a separated shoulder, and a spinal injury. He was incapacitated. Finally, shortly before 9 p.m., Captain Walbridge requested Coast Guard assistance and activated the Bounty's emergency radio beacon. By 9.30, the water on board had gotten so deep that it disabled the ship's only remaining generator. With it went the main bilge pumps. The only equipment still running was one propulsion engine and the backup portable pump. By midnight, these had failed as well. The bounty was adrift in a hurricane without pumps or propulsion. Around this time, a Coast Guard C-130 Hercules arrived overhead to assess the situation. The Coast Guard planned on rescuing the crew via helicopter, but it would have to wait until morning. The present conditions were too hazardous for a nighttime rescue. The Coast Guard notified the Bounty that helicopters would arrive at 8 a.m. to pick them up. Water was now six feet deep in the vessel and the crew was preparing to abandon ship. Some were injured, but all were on their last legs. They had not slept in two days and had pushed their bodies to their limits battling the storm. At about two in the morning, the water was 10 feet deep. The crew gathered together and donned immersion suits and life jackets. Some of them harnessed themselves together to keep them from drifting apart in the open ocean. Captain Walbridge made the decision that the crew should remain aboard the bounty until it was no longer safe to do so. This would be the captain's final mistake, as waiting until the bounty sank to abandon ship meant risking the crew being pulled underwater along with the submerging vessel. They needed to escape the doomed ship before it went down. At around 4.30 a.m., a large wave knocked the bounty onto its starboard side, and the crew had to rapidly abandon ship. They entered the water in total darkness. At the time, winds were gusting up to 90 knots, and swells were 20 feet high. As the crew tried to swim away, they became entangled in the rigging from the sinking ship. Two crew members who were clipped together were dragged underwater. One of the crew members was able to untangle himself, but the other had to exit his immersion suit to free himself. At 6.41 a.m., 
the first Coast Guard MH-60 Jayhawk helicopter arrived to rescue the crew. Fourteen crew members were picked up and transferred to Elizabeth City, North Carolina for medical treatment. Deckhand Claudine Christian perished in the incident. Captain Robin Walbridge was never found and is presumed dead. In their report of the incident, the National Transportation Safety Board concluded that the probable cause of the sinking of the bounty was the captain's reckless decision to sail into the path of Hurricane Sandy. They also noted that a contributing factor was the lack of safety oversight by the HMS Bounty Organization by entrusting all aspects of the ship's operation to Captain Walbridge without checks and balances. The Coast Guard performed an investigation into the incident as well. They noted that the disaster was entirely avoidable and that if the HMS Bounty Organization or Captain Walbridge had exercised proper responsibility, judgment, and prudence, this casualty would have been prevented. They went on to say that any mariner must have a profound respect for the sea and the forces of nature, and the value of a vessel pales in comparison to that of a human life. Claudine Christian was a volunteer deckhand on the Bounty. She drowned after being swept out to sea, abandoning ship. Claudine Christian was actually a descendant of Fletcher Christian, the lead mutineer on the original HMS Bounty. This relationship is what inspired Claudine to volunteer aboard the replica bounty more than 200 years later. Claudine had joined the ship less than six months before the incident, with no prior experience in sailing. Claudine was adventurous, passionate, and full of love and wonder. She is remembered as someone who packed more experiences into her life than most ever will. She was an outstanding singer and songwriter, and you can find some of her songs on her YouTube channel, including Hermosa Beach. I'm walking down Pier Street with the moon on the water. I'm trying to find a purpose for my bar stage night. I hold you in the daylight. Oh, you. Thank you for watching my video. I would like to continue making short documentaries of aviation and marine accidents. If you enjoyed this one and would like to see more, please subscribe so you'll be notified when I upload in the future. If you have any suggestions or feedback, please let me know in the comments below. Thank you.